Thank you. Thank you for that welcome. Um, what we want to try and do this morning uh, is perhaps a little over ambitious, uh, which you'll see, because what we want to do is to see if we can creatively disrupt the direction of computer applications and the digital more generally within archaeology. So it's a fairly big target uh, that we're aiming at. Um, and also think about the manner in which computer applications are adopted within archaeology and then affect um, our practice. Next one. Mm -hmm. Try this one. My assistant isn't, isn't working at all. Here we go. So we're, do, we're, we're suggesting this in the face of what seems to us to be a certain degree of uh, disciplinary drift, for want of a better description. Um, digital technologies are increasingly fundamental to everything that we do, but it's kind of come about in a somewhat haphazard fashion. And on the one hand, you can see this sort of haphazard approach as being uh, a very good thing, a sign of uh, openness and multifocality uh, within the discipline. Uh, but equally, you could argue that this sort of diversity uh, that we've arrived at is, is in some respects unsustainable uh, and insufficiently rigorous uh, in the face of, in particular, external events, you know, economic, political upheaval, uh, violence, social conflict, and so on. And whilst we're not necessarily here talking about extinction-level events for archaeology, uh, nonetheless, we are thinking about disruptions that do significantly impact uh, upon the discipline. In the UK, uh, a recent example is, is the government's uh, proposal uh, to use graduate pay levels uh, as a means of uh, rating the quality and value of degrees, which for archaeology is a significant threat since you know, your average senior archaeologist salary is barely the equivalent of the average graduate starter salary. So archaeology is going to be seriously affected uh, by that sort of introduction. So this is a, a picture of a digital mediated archaeology produced by Anthony Sinclair. It's a very complex picture, but it doesn't begin to tell the whole story. Uh, because in addition to, uh, to all this sort of information, uh, we've got vast quantities of grey literature. Uh, we've also got quantities of grey data that are generated by commercial archaeology. On top of that, you've got all the products of digital creativity of a plethora of individuals uh, who are makers uh, and creators in their own rights. Combine that sort of size of knowledge base uh, with the number of academic, uh, professional, academic, public sector, voluntary archaeological organisations and individuals across the world. You can begin to see the size of the challenge of assessing the archaeological knowledge scale. And all of these different elements are in different ways uh, affected by disruptions and threats which results in things like political, economic and social landscapes being recast. So, you know, an obvious example, I guess, for all of us is this, the effect of the subprime uh, collapse in 2008, which in, certainly in the UK and elsewhere uh, caused major funding crises uh, for archaeology and a consequent loss of experience, knowledge and know-how. So the question is, how do we build knowledge, resilience, flexibility uh, and agility into what we do. <laughs> Thank you very much. And to answer this, we've, we've tried to use the futurity uh, technique of scenario analysis to generate and assess plausible scenarios to enable us to gain a, a more strategic view uh, of where digital, the digital archaeology knowledge scape may be heading. Uh, and in the process, start to think about putting in place measures uh, to make that knowledge, uh, knowledge scape more robust and capable of withstanding uh, foreseeable future disruptions, uh, but at the same time not trying to stifle uh, the creativity that we all value. And so for this analysis we've identified two critical uncertainties. Uh, on the one hand we have the expanding spectrum of archaeological knowledge practices, and on the other hand we have the remorseless uh, spread and expansion of digital tools and technologies uh, into every aspect of our lives. And we presented these as a pair of uh, axes, as you can see here, and at one end of the archaeological knowledge practice, practice axis, we have the accredited professional specialists who are securely employed in large uh, organisations. And at the opposite end, we have the independent knowledge workers who are often working in sort of freelance uh, fashion, unaffiliated to any particular institutions, uh, and collaborating freely to a greater or lesser extent as they see fit. And this differentiation establishes a series of tensions. So, for example, where does the basis of authority lie uh, in, on this spectrum? Who decides the research agendas? And who, what, what constitutes best practice and who's actually defining best practice? 
And on our other axis, we have uh, at one end of the technological axis, a set of traditional, established, and quite often privileged, uh, tried and tested tools, applications, technologies, and methods. And at the other end, we have this proliferation of novel, unmonitored, uncensored digital technologies and tools, which are becoming increasingly ubiquitous. And again, a whole series of tensions arise. Here, for example, how the digital tools and techniques adopted, who determines which tools are deployed, when and where and by whom. So we've ended up defining what effectively we've seen as four distinct uh, archaeological scenarios that emerge from this analysis. And we've simply characterised them in the form of these labels that you see here. Uh, so we have the Ministry of Digital Orthodoxy, we have the Academy of Digital Advancement, we have the School of Digital, Digital Citizenry, and we have the Commune of Digital Creativity. I'm going to leave Paul to explain a little bit more about what we mean by this. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. So the idea of scenario analysis is that you create plausible futures. So these are, we haven't stretched the envelope to say we're going way out there. So these are things that you will see in the world today. And the reason you do the analysis to say if there is disruption, what happens within each of these scenarios and what do they look like? So what we try to do first is, and we're going to do this at, we're going to go fly very high since we've only got five minutes. So, um, but you'll get the point that we go through the different scenarios and then we say, what do we have to do to be able to address all of these scenarios? What is the shape of the knowledge landscape we need to be thinking about to handle, to make us this resilient, robust knowledge shape that we need to be? So just hold that in your mind that we'll, as I go through these quite quickly. So the ministry is probably the orthodox world that we know most people have originated from. So in that environment, it's often state-sponsored, it's a wall garden environment, professionally accredited, there are stands of best practice, people have titles and jobs and career paths. Uh, and they typically would have increasingly standard workflows and work products, the types of things they'll be producing, and they will be going into standardised archives. Now, in this particular wall garden, each of these wall gardens is, in effect, a silo. So it's strong in the sense that we've been, we're building up the data, but it's peculiar to this professional environment. So that's, that's the simplest one we start with. If we now move into the academy, the academy is now we're moving into the international university environment, typically in research units. So here, these people, and some, many of the people in this room will be in that box, they will be part of elite academies that we work on cross-national, cross-disciplinary projects. Uh, the buzzwords will be open, will be interoperable. Uh, but the downside of that environment is it's controlled by a small number of elite universities. So you might start thinking about that as a form of intellectual colonialism if you're not on the privileged list of institutions. So the danger there is this friction between a small group of uh, thought leaders and everybody else. If we start looking at the, the uh, public archaeology spaces, then what we generally see, to be, what we saw to begin with was taking things that were developed in the ministry or the academy, and those workflows, are, first of all, were broken down into micro tasks, which then could be distributed among citizen scientists who would then replicate the type of work, the types of databases, the types of knowledge. So it's, it's incremental. However, as we start moving up the scale and we get more interesting projects, for instance, the Accord project, they, they empowered people in the community to use more advanced tools. And the, 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 the cost of access to technology means that there are more and more people who are not in the academy, who are not in the ministry, who have access to more sophisticated types of tools and techniques, which they can start deploying using alternative narratives in their own space. So in this space, we're, we start to become more radical we're, and we're breaking away. The academies are starting to lose control of the, over the production of knowledge, which is quite nice. It's getting quite exciting in this space. The last space is where we've moved into, we've now got ubiquitous tools uh, and we're fully deregulating environments. Now this environment can be seen in two, two types of scenarios. One we'll do is 
the utopian view that it's all lovely and everything's working out. So it is liberalised, it is deregulated and it is decentralised. Projects are fluid, people come and go, project teams are curated, uh, but it's self-governed and it's an enlightened environment, people help each other out. The ethos is of cooperation, openness, sharing and pluralism is accepted. The connection and support of the landscape is perhaps using clouds, we've all come to some kinds of consensus, enlightened self-interest. So that's, that's a utopian view. The same environment looked at from a slightly different view, which has been disrupted, is, fra is fragmented, fractured, suboptimized. Funding is not reaching, is not being dispersed to the places of need. Cost cutting, underfunding, no critical mass. People go from fat, dumb, and happy, straight through lean and mean to scared and skinny. In that environment, people start looking after their own data, they use it as power as a form of employment. Perhaps they start cutting things, data is on local disk drives, not shared. That knowledge is effectively put at risk. So in this environment, this version of the, 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 the liberalised market, we have the danger of a second digital dark age where our data is dispersed and lost through a lack of storage, lack of backup, lack of consensus. So what does all of those four scenarios imply for us? So as I said at the beginning, with the idea of scenario analysis, and we're, we're giving you the short answer to this, uh, we, have, we have actually written this up and offered it to uh, the Journal of CAA to give us more detail. The idea is what do we need to do for all four of these things in the future? And we, we have come up with uh, a disciplinary grand challenge in effect. So we've drawn this value chain of this is how you might, you might conceive of the archaeological endeavour. Starting from research, moving away through to synthesis, these are types of activities. The data and knowledge around this is not only in databases and machines, it's also in people, it's in communities. So if you go through the assets we have, we have different types of resources, HERs, uh, we have different capabilities, we have professional capabilities, we have competencies and how people apply those capabilities, we have the knowledge bases themselves, people think of those, and we have communities of practice. And, and so on. As a discipline, if we go into the, the red box, which is what we're increasingly seeing, we need to start mapping out as a group, and this is probably the best place to start, we, we need to have an enterprise model, like we have a consensus model of what archaeology is, how we practice it. To begin with, the, I was a, by the way, I was a knowledge uh, broker for IBM Corporation, so I've been at the, the sharp end of this. And you can start with very simple, high-level models, like what are the activities like we've seen? Draw them out, decompose them, start producing maps, then find out where the duplicates are and where the gaps are. And then communities like this can start addressing creatively to fill that model. Uh, but we, we need to be able to dis define where, we're, where we are and have a, an idea of where we want to go. So it's not rocket science, but it's a lot of hard work. Thank you.